Hey guys, and welcome back to the 13th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on convicted killer Judy Bueno Año, who was executed in 1971 in the state of Florida. Judy was born on April 4th, 1943 in Texas, and was actually given the name Judaya Welty. Growing up, Judy had a rough childhood, and her mother died when she was just four years old from tuberculosis. Judy and her baby brother Robert were able to live with her grandparents, but her two older siblings were put into foster care. Years later, Judy's father remarried and took Judy and her younger brother Robert in. Judy claimed that both her father and stepmother abused her and treated her like a slave. She was beaten, starved, and was forced to work long hours. By the age of 14, Judy could no longer handle the abuse and she ended up attacking her parents as well as her half-brothers and was sentenced to two months in juvie. After she served her two months, she was given the option to go back to her family or go to a reform school and she chose the latter. She went to Foothills High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico and was able to graduate in 1959. She completely cut ties with her family, including her younger brother Robert, whom she eventually harbored ill feelings for, and even went on record saying that she wouldn't even spit down his throat if his guts were on fire. A year after graduating high school, she got a job as a nurse under a fake name of Anna Schultz and had her first son by the name of Michael Schultz by an unknown man. On January 21st, 1962, Judy married a man by the name of James Goodyear, who was an Air Force officer. The two had a son together by the name of James Jr. in 1966, and while celebrating the birth of his first son, James surprised Judy by adopting Michael and giving him his last name. A year later, the two had a daughter named Kimberly, and the family then moved to Florida. James Sr. was on tour in Vietnam and came home in June of 1971. Just three months after returning home, he fell ill and was sent to a U.S. Naval Hospital in Orlando, Florida, but none of the staff was able to pinpoint exactly what was wrong with him. He died on September 15, 1971, and just five days after his death, Judy cashed in on three life insurance policies. Before the year had ended, Judy's home was accidentally set on fire and she was able to collect on close to $100,000 in fire insurance. A few months later, Judy was already living with a new man named Bobby Joe Morris. Michael was having issues with his new living arrangements and started acting out in school and overall Judy was just not happy with him around. She got Michael into a residential foster care and continued her life with her new man and other children. In 1977, Bobby moved his new family to Colorado and Michael was able to rejoin the family. Before leaving Florida though, their home mysteriously was set on fire and she was able to collect on fire insurance yet again. Soon after the family's move to Colorado, Bobby became ill and went to the hospital but was discharged because the doctors could not find anything wrong with him. A couple of days after being discharged, Bobby collapsed and was taken back to the hospital only to die the same day on January 21st, 1978. Going along with the reoccurring name change theme, the same year, Judy changed her last name to Bueno Año to pay tribute to her first husband's last name, Goodyear. Bueno meaning good and Año meaning year in Spanish. In 1979, Judy's son Michael joined the army, but out of nowhere, he started to lose feeling in his upper and lower limbs. He was diagnosed with suffering from arsenic poisoning and was put in leg braces and discharged from the army with his mother being his caretaker. On March 13, 1980, Judy took Michael and her other son James out canoeing. With another obvious mystery, the canoe turned over and Judy and James were able to get from under the canoe and survived. Unfortunately, Michael's metal braces were too heavy and he ended up drowning. There was a brief investigation, but ultimately, investigators believed what Judy had to say about the events leading up to Michael's death in the canoe incident.
Judy was then able to collect $20,000 from Michael's life insurance from the military. With the money she collected from Michael's insurance policy, Judy opened up a beauty salon and started a relationship with a man named John Gentry. Judy was able to woo him and also convince him of how successful she was and got him to accept taking life insurance policies out on each other for $500,000. Soon after this agreement, John began taking vitamins that were given to him by and suggested by Judy. John began feeling sick after taking the pills and Judy suggested that he double the dosage. On June 25th, 1983, Judy and John went out to celebrate because she told John that she was pregnant. There is another account that says both of them went out to celebrate one of her employees' birthdays. Her, Michael, and her employees went to go eat at a restaurant, and Judy suggested that Michael go to the liquor store to get alcohol so they could continue celebrating elsewhere. He agreed and left to go to his car, and as soon as he started his car, a bomb attached to the car exploded, leaving metal in his back. He survived and was immediately sent to the hospital. After a few days in the hospital, he was able to answer questions from detectives and they in turn started to look closely into Judy and her background. She had no medical background like she told Michael when she was persuading him about life insurance and not only was she not pregnant, but she had a cruise booked for her and her kids only. So that could only mean she did not anticipate John surviving the car bomb. And since bombings are a federal offense, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms were notified, and they identified two sticks of dynamite attached to the taillights and traced the dynamite to a man in Alabama who was a friend of Judy's. When police went to search Judy's home, they found the vitamin capsules John was taking, and after tests, they were confirmed to contain arsenic. After another search of her home, they found wire and tape that matched the bomb found in the car. They also had a search warrant for her nail salon and found formaldehyde, which was a disinfectant and used in her concoction she was putting in the vitamin capsules. After this, she was arrested and charged with the attempted murder of John. On January 11, 1984, Judy was charged with the murder of her son, Michael. The following month, they dug up the body of Bobby Joe Morris and they found arsenic in his body. And the month after that, in March of 1984, they exhumed the body of James Goodyear and he was also found to have arsenic in his body. Judy had a separate trial for each murder and the attempted murder of John. For the murder of her son Michael, she was given life without parole on June 6, 1984. She was somehow acquitted for the attempted murder of John, but was found guilty for the murder of her first husband, James. On November 26, 1985, after 10 hours of deliberation, jurors sentenced her to death by electrocution. Judy was sent to Boward County Correctional Center in Florida and spent 13 years on death row. Judy said, Don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the face I wear, for I wear a thousand masks. Masks I'm afraid to take off, and none of them are me. Pretending is an art that's second nature to me, but don't be fooled for God's sake. Don't be fooled. Hours before her execution, she spent time with her kids, Kimberly and James, and during her last televised TV interview, she said she would like to clear the record for her grandson, and she wants him to know that his grandma was not a murderer. I guess that was just another mask she put on. I don't see how anyone could believe another word from her mouth after admitting something like that. It was Monday, March 30th, 1998, and she had a final meal of broccoli, asparagus, strawberries, and tea. Her head was shaved bald, and she was put in a 75-year-old electric chair with three legs that was built by inmates in 1923. She made no final statement, and a leather mask was placed over her head. She was strapped in at 7.08 a.m. and was pronounced dead at 7.13 a.m. Judy was the first woman put to death in Florida since 1848, and the third woman executed in the United States since 1976, when executions were reinstated. Thanks for taking the time to listen and watch the 13th episode of Death Row Executions. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and subscribe.